Hey folks, it's Eric from Seven Oaks House Museum again. Uh, we're here today to talk about flat textiles, right? That's kind of boring museum lingo, but we're talking about things like quilts, those kind of flat fabric objects that a lot of us have from grandmothers that have been passed down through the family. Um, for those of you who haven't been able to join us in previous weeks, I'm the curator here at Seven Oaks House Museum, uh, and that's where we are right now. We're in the parlor of the oldest home in Winnipeg. Uh, it was built way back in the 1850s for a family called the Inksters. Uh, and the Inkster family were a very powerful, kind of influential Scottish Métis family that lived here in this area. Uh, and they played a big role in the development of our city. They lived in this house for almost 100 years, and we're actually very, very fortunate to have a number of objects that uh, were donated or that actually stayed in the house that belonged to the family. So we get this really interesting, for me, very unique personal spin on history. So often what you hear in history books is the big picture, right? They talk about the city, they talk about certain famous men, but the real personal experiences and lives of people, especially women here, uh, are not always very well told. But by looking at these objects, by examining their history, especially in the context of their home here and what we know about the family, we get to learn a lot of really interesting things and it gives us some really cool insights uh, that aren't otherwise always available. But the first piece that I'm going to talk about is this quilt here. Uh, this is a really, really interesting one. I am not necessarily a quilting person, but we've had a few experts come in who just drooled over this. Um, and for a number of years, I didn't really realize what was so special about it. I knew it was old, but I couldn't really get much further than that. After a lot of detailed study uh, by some experts, we concluded that this quilt is real old, not just old. Uh, some parts of it, actually, the fabric are as old as the 1820s. The quilt itself might date from the 1840s or 1850s, but likely not a lot later than that. The very interesting thing about quilts like this is, uh, I'm just going to turn around here because I feel like I'm on my bad side over there. The interesting thing about quilts like this is that they tell their own story in a very interesting way. Uh, and it's not always apparent, but you'll notice when we come in for the close-up that it's made up of many, many, many different squares, different patterns of fabric. And quilt like this would have mostly been made out of leftovers. It's not like today when you can just go to the fabric shop and you can pick a hundred different swatches that all go together in the right palette. Fabric was expensive. You bought it to make clothes for your family. Uh, and something like this, while it was necessary, was also kind of a fun artwork. And most people didn't have a lot of money to put into it. So you would save things in the rag bag, right? When a shirt wore out, when you couldn't fix a pair of pants anymore, you would cut them up and they could be used for things like these quilts. Potentially quilts can even be reused to make other quilts later, right? And so you see a huge diversity of patterns that were collected over 20, 30 years, maybe even longer by uh, one woman or by a family or even by a group of friends. And then they assembled it into this quilt. Something like this, you know, everything is hand stitched together. This represents hundreds of hours of work. And one person could have done it, but it also might have been a family project, a mother working with her daughters. It also could have been a community project. You often see these commemorative quilts that were put together by many different people from an area to create kind of a record of the community's history. Now, we don't have anything that obvious here. I'll tell you a little bit more about that with a different quilt. Um, but for those of you who are into quilting, into textiles, you will probably be impressed by how beautiful these pieces are. Uh, they're all from different scraps, but it creates this really lovely, unified kind of pastel palette. These aren't just faded, these are intentional color choices. And the thing that I find really, really, really cool is that many of these individual squares are actually made up of different types of fabric. It's quite interesting. You know, obviously she didn't have enough pieces of this blue pattern here, so she got a similar pattern in a different color and stitched them together so that she wouldn't ruin the overall effect. And that just shows so much attention to detail, which I think is really cool. Whereas most of us would just go to the store and buy something else, people back then in the 1830s, 1840s had to make it work. Uh, you know, if you wanted more fabric, it was coming on a boat from England. It would take months to get here. It could even take a year to get here. So you kind of had to work with what you had, and people could still create beautiful artworks as a result. There are a few really interesting patterns you're going to see in the close-up. One of my favorites here is this very interesting four-colored circle, because it actually looks almost exactly like the design that we know as a medicine wheel today. It definitely isn't. This is a European uh, pattern, European fabric, 
but it's interesting in the context of this house and this family to kind of to notice that, right? Now, this other quilt here is a little bit more along the maybe community history angle or more obviously family, family history angle. This is what's called a crazy quilt. Um, there isn't too much to see on the back, although it's actually quite neat. This one doesn't have a backing, so you can see all the raw stitches here, all the different bits of, uh, bits of thread that were used for the embroidery. But they're called crazy quilts. Uh, I think the reason is fairly obvious, right? Uh, compared to something like this that's very geometric, it's square, it's rigid, this is all over the place. It's crazy. I think it's really beautiful. Uh, you could almost say it's expressive, right? Like we have abstract expressionist painters who like throw paint at the canvas. Well, for me, this is almost abstract expressionist needlework, right? You pick uh, all different shapes, all different crazy sizes. You stitch them with these very, I'm going to say organic uh, types of stitches. They almost look like plants branching out. These are like little, uh, little leaves basically or flowers growing out of the stitch. And it allows a lot of creativity uh, that's very overt, something you don't necessarily see in a quilt like this. They often use all these different really rich, beautiful velvet fabrics. And the crazy quilt tradition started out in Victorian England. It was very, very popular there, but people picked it up here too as well. Now, these often incorporate different embroidered designs and also initials. So these are probably the initials of the people who worked on it. Um, the W, it's hard to say, but we've got BS here. This one, MS, or sorry, AS. So probably this was a family project, right? A mother and her daughter, two daughters working together. And beyond just saving beautiful fabrics that they liked and decorating them, they also would save things like this. Happy 20 Social Club. So it's, it's a commemorative ribbon, actually. Um, this would have been given out in an event by a club, probably a dance that the two girls went to together. It's hard to know for sure. But I've even seen, rib uh, seen quilts like this that incorporate ribbons from political rallies. You'll see like the Happy 20 dance and then, you know, John A. Macdonald for prime minister. Uh, they were like significant events maybe that happened in the year that this was made or just in their life together that they wanted to remember by putting them together in this way. So it's a beautiful object, and now it's a really, really cool historical record. It's not just what some historian thought was important, it's what these people thought was important at that time, and we have to kind of put it together, puzzle out the story from looking at the object now. Now, just to change things up a little bit here, we're going to look at a couple of very different types of textiles here. So most of you probably recognize these. Um, these are, we would call them in French, a ceinture fléché. Uh, in English, we would just say a sash, basically. A lot of people here would probably say a voyageur sash. These are really associated with the voyageurs. And they started out as a utilitarian object. Uh, these were multi-purpose, it was a multi-tool, right? For the voyageurs, for the Yorkmen who were uh, working in the fur trade, they would carry thousands of pounds of furs on their back, shipping them from portage to portage down the rivers. Um, and in the course of doing that, you need a strap, right? Very often, people would use these belts um, to wrap around a heavy package, and then you could put it around your head uh, to help you support it as you're carrying it on your back. This is going to sound gross, but I swear it's true. They also help keep your insides in when you were lifting too much. You see power lifters wear these big leather belts, right, to stop themselves from getting a hernia. This was the 19th century version of that. These voyageurs would lift 800 pounds at a time on their back. Incredibly strong men doing things that are not good for a person. You wrap this belt around your waist enough times and tightly enough, and it would stop you from getting that hernia when you lifted too much. So they were made originally in an area in Quebec as I understand it. Uh, people talk about a pattern called the Assomption Sash that's kind of like similar to this one. It's the most common type that you see today uh, and it came from an area in Quebec. But very, very quickly they became a fashion item. They started out with the voyageurs but uh, average people saw them wearing them and they thought they looked good. Uh, especially in different indigenous communities they became tremendously popular objects to wear. Um, and so different regional styles developed. Different towns, different regions, different areas had their own patterns and their own colors. Uh, and there are scholars today who have done some really cool research trying to locate these patterns and uncover the meaning of them. 
Some people believe that the different colors represent different things, and in many cases that may be true, but we don't always know that story today. Uh, the reason I'm showing you two of them, though, is uh, basically just to compare and to contrast them. This one here looks familiar probably to a lot of people. This is very much like what you would see somebody wearing at Festival today. It was handmade, but it was made on a loom. So it still took a lot of time, but it was done basically mechanically. And when you really look at it up close, you can see that it's rough. It's made with big, thick wool. It's just, it doesn't have the most beautiful, fine appearance to it, right? But looking at this one, this is the original. This is a finger-woven, handmade uh, sash that would have been worn by somebody in the 19th century. Uh, this one might have been dress wear, maybe it wasn't used day to day, um, but it's made out of incredibly thin, fine wool strands woven together uh, in a very special way, just by hand. You don't use a loom, you don't do anything mechanical, you just suspend them and you weave them together with your fingers. Now, finger weaving is, uh, people have been reviving it recently. It used to be very, very uncommon, but it's so time consuming and painstaking. I've been told that a sash of this length probably took someone 400 to 500 hours to make. Uh, it's really incredible work and it's so beautiful and it was, uh, it was important to people back then. They wore these things daily and they used them for a lot of reasons. Today these sashes have uh, a lot of cultural meaning associated with them as well. Uh, many of the voyageurs, people who worked as coureurs des bois in the fur trade, were Métis men. Uh, and so Especially today, it's become seen as a symbol of Métis identity. Some people even see it as a type of regalia, in a sense. Um, now, that's not where it started out. These were functional objects. They became a fashion symbol, but meanings change over time. Uh, and so today, you even see like there is a Saint Boniface pattern to represent you know, the Saint Boniface Métis people that people make sashes out of. Uh, so it's really interesting, and I find it really beautiful to see these traditions take on their own life now. Um, so we can learn a lot about the people who made these things, the people who use these things, um, and in certain ways learn a lot about ourselves too when we examine our own traditions in relation to this stuff.